Thank you very much. Uh, very uh, grateful for the opportunity uh, to be here today. I, uh, uh, I'm very impressed with the group. I'm telling you, everybody's here, and uh, we're uh, blessed to hear uh, uh, Dr. Zachs and Dr. W uh, Warner this afternoon, and I intend to take a lot of notes as well. We, um, it's my pleasure to present uh, a, v a view, an overview maybe, with a little bit more emphasis at the end on, on the, what I think is a new paradigm for medical therapy, and that's theranostics. We, uh, we, uh, Dr. Sue and I have a program uh, along with a team, a large team, at the University of Iowa in Iowa City. And uh, we've had our clinic now 16 years there. Uh, we, uh, I take care of, uh, look after about 1,700 folks with the neuroendocrine tumors. And we have seven dedicated clinics a week for neuroendocrine tumors. But what I'd like to share with you, and it's all on your handout uh, in order, is I'd like to enflesh a little bit of the neuroendocrine ther medical therapy and how it came to be in a few slides, and then talk to some of the very basics that most of you in the audience, I'm sure, are very aware. Things that constitute the ability to uh, look, at, uh, uh, neuro uh, look at tissue of neuroendocrine tumors, be able to predict how they uh, are be able to know forward how they behave in a natural way. And then to show you some of the modalities, just touch briefly on a few of the uh, efforts that we've made at uh, the university uh, in terms of uh, therapy, including uh, some important uh, work by our neurosurgeon, neuroendocrine surgeon, Dr. Jim Howe. And, and then end it with the principle that, uh, that drives all of endocrinology. It's a principle where you have a hormone attaching to its natural receptor on a cell and executing a biologic action, but also can be exploited. Dr. Zacks this morning spoke about the uh, octreotide congeners. I tend to call them congeners, but most people call them analogs. There's a slight difference. A congener is a, a lookalike of a, of a natural substance but it's, synthes it's synthesized and it's made to last longer. So in that case, it's a congener, not really a true um, uh, lookalike, which is an analog. That's the exact same uh, protein that uh, nature gave us. And then uh, show how that's been exploited. You're all aware of PRRNT now. And, and so uh, the combination of using the very same synthetic peptide to do a scan and the very same identical synthetic peptide to do therapy is called Theranostics. So I'm going to move along here and I promise to finish within, I hope, 51 and a half minutes and we'll see what we can do. So what is the, en the evolution of, um, oh, I think I got stuck. Oh, maybe I have to do this. Okay, good, I'll see there. The evolution of, uh, of neuro and, uh, neuropeptides and the evolution of hormones started in, in 1902 with the um, discovery of secretin, which was the first hormone of the bowel by Bayless and Starling. And then J.S. Edkins identified the gastrin, the peptide gastrin in his work with dogs. These were all physiologists in the early times. Let me see if I can get this to go again. And see if I can get, there we go. And then in 1907, uh, Siegfried Ober Oberdorfer uh, started to look at the bowel at these little tumors, and he thought they were benign. He said, these look so much like normal cells that they're just benign. But then these patients over time started to have problems with their liver, and, they, and they, he found that these tumors from the bowel moved to the liver. And he then changed his, his story. He said, these, these uh, unusual look-alike tumors are carcinoida, which comes from the German word carcinoma-like. He said, they look normal. They look very normal, but they're moving. And there, for 100 years, we had all neuroendocrine tumors defined as carcinoid tumors. 
It wasn't until 2000, the year 2000, that the nomenclature got more defined uh, and, and precise by our pathology community. I'm just not doing so good on this thing here. Let's see here, pardon me. And then we had insulin was isolated from sheep in, uh, in uh, 1921, and the first patient was treated with insulin uh, uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, he, ha he was a type 1 diabetic, needed insulin to stay alive, and they used the extract to, to treat it. Bayless, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Best uh, was the uh, student at the time uh, that, they, uh, that they isolated the um, insulin and it became a Nobel Prize. And let me see, I keep going here. I, I want to stop for a second there and put those up there. But you see the I-131 therapy. There's a long story on that. And in a brief moment, in, in the 1930s, a man named Saul Hurst at Mass General Hospital decided that since iodine goes to the thyroid gland, that he could use radioactive iodine and treat cancers of the thyroid. This was the first use of internal a radioactive material. Well, then the war came about and he was drafted and he asked his trusted colleague at Mass General if he would watch his uh, 30 patients and keep an eye on them while he was away. Well, his trusted colleague went ahead and talked to his trusted colleague and they published all of this work of, of Saul Hurst without any knowledge that Dr. Hurst had. And so when he came back, he revisited his own patients and finally wrote his own paper. And the reason I know that story is the daughter of Dr. Hurst actually called me four or five weeks ago and told me this story. And it was very powerful to hear her talk and how he did get justice by you know, being able to publish his own work that they had pirated from him. Well, then here's the Zollinger and Ellison. And you folks, uh, some folks were talking about Zollinger and Ellison. In 1955, Robert Zollinger and Ed Ellison described two patients who had tumors in their pancreas that they suspected was, were making very high amounts of, of gastrin, causing bleeding ulcers in these patients. One was a 17-year-old, the other was 50 years old. And when I came to Ohio State in 1972, Dr. Zollinger, after a few years, getting to know me a little bit, uh, asked me if I would take care of, uh, of the 17-year-old patient, which I had the pleasure of doing for 28 years. She passed at the age of 68, unrelated to her Zollinger-Ellison uh, syndrome, her pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. She had a blood clot, actually, was lurking and had a blood clot and passed away. But the point of that was Dr. Zollinger at the time took the stomachs out of these people which is the target organ of gastrin. So high gastrin beats up the stomach, makes you make more acid, which causes ulcers and diarrhea. So now you have the field of the carcinoida in the small bowel, and then you have the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. This was the, uh, the stark introduction, if you will, from 1955 forward that brought the clinical arena uh, together uh, with the physiologic work. Let me see if I get this right here. I don't know what I'm doing. Can you, is there anybody that can just come and help me get this right? Here, good. Should be able to move this thing by pressing, but it keeps, it, do I have to move the arrow every time too? No. Okay, here. Just, just press, just press that. Okay, let's try it again. It's not doing it. See, I promise you. Here I go. My, here I come to see yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready to do okay. That okay, um, go ahead. See, because I. Yeah, yeah I'm just somewhere back. Yeah. yeah. That's right. All right, now. It's just not moving forward. Why That's what. I hate when technology doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, any experts? Listen, so the other day I was doing the grand rounds and uh, I had to tell everybody to turn their beepers off in their phones. So, so yeah. Down down now, okay, and that moment. to go back. I don't care. Okay, okay, this one, yeah. So you got them set in. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't really okay. Get in, so. okay, very good. So, um, so I told everybody that I had to make the announcement to do it, and I no sooner start talking that my phone rings. 
And so, and, so <laughs> and you know, it just takes you right off the way from where you were. So I go and turn it off, and I thought it was off, and I keep talking, the phone rings again. And, you know, by that time, I got so combobbled that I turned the screen off. And, I mean, and this, you're talking to a seasoned vet here, I'll tell you. And that was Zollinger, and okay, now we can go. I'll just move forward. But these were all the points of discovery. Now, 1973, Brazo and Guillemin and Shalley isolated somatostatin. Comes from the Greek word body stopper. And somatostatin is the native natural substance that gave rise to the congeners of octreotide and lanreotide. Octreotide we had in the United States, as we heard, or since 1989, and lanreotide now, depo, is in the United States as of almost a year ago. And those are the two lookalikes of the native substance. There was a group in, in Sandoz, now Novartis, and uh, I'm not conflicted, but they were the ones that recognized somatostatin to be a very important substance in the body and that they must make a lookalike of it, a synthetic uh, substance, hormone lookalike, if you will. And that began then the discovery work for octreotide, which was a, uh, came out in 1980. And the, the yellow-shirted person is Janos Plesch. He's the one that led 50 chemists to make this eight amino acid structure, which lanreotide, I'll show you a picture of, is also similar, very similar to the octreotide. And both of them are very similar to the native peptide, as we'll see. So in 1980, we had octreotide. Then we had octreoscan that came into the United States. And all octreoscan was was the lookalike octreotide. And they put indium-111 on it. And now you have a scan. But at that time, they weren't aware that it was binding specifically to the receptor subtype 2 that you heard about from Dr. Zacks. But they knew it, it identified neuroendocrine tumors. And since 1994, um, uh, we've had Octreoscan in the United States. And now we've advanced to using the Gallium-68, which is a positron emission tomography scan for the same substance. And now you have what they call a PET scan, which is much more sensitive and specific than the Octreoscan. But Octreoscan has served a great purpose. And then there was some uh, ability to identify using the octreotide intraoperatively and being able to measure it with a Geiger counter probe. And last but not least was the um, Theranostics introduced by, oops, I'm sorry, I wanted to see, by Richard Baum. And this was uh, the first World Congress of the Gallium-68 PET scan with the treatment using the very same arrow, the very same carrier with a cage on the back, and the cage has gallium in it, and you have a scan. You take the gallium out of the cage, and you put yttrium-90 in it, or lutetium-177, and voila, you have, voila, you have theranostics. And that's the term theranostics, and, and it just means using the identical carrier, the identical arrow, to go to its target, which is the receptor subtype 2. Now, the incidence of, of these neuroendocrine tumors, why are, we, why are we focusing on them, rightly so? And if you can see the red line, you can see that there's been a 500% increase in neuroendocrine tumors in the United States. Since about 1989, there has been 500% rise. And that dotted line above it are all the other cancers together over years. So you can appreciate that there's been a growth. You'll say, well, it's more uh, better diagnostic accuracy. Perhaps, perhaps. But they suspect that there's something else involved. It's intriguing. We heard something about adrenaline. And anything that has an adrenaline drive action is not good for folks that have these neuroendocrine tumors, especially the carcinoids of the bowel, because it stimulates the release. You've all heard of the five E's, exercise, emotion, excitability, ethanol, wine, whiskey, beer, even eating, the act of eating turns on adrenaline. And in the process of doing something with adrenaline, you now have surges of serotonin normally, 
and even more dramatic when there are already high levels. So the E's are all driven by uh, adrenaline. This is just to show you a one large series from Spain that say that the uh, regional, the, if you have a tumor that's just where it is versus regional where it's in the lymph nodes versus uh, something that goes to distant to, uh, liver, that if you go, uh, those are how you define the stages of these tumors. And the grade, you all know grade one, two, and three, we'll define those based on the KI-67 in a moment. But as you look at the curves, the grade three are the, high, are the, the highest uh, uh, proliferation rate tumors. We'll talk to those very briefly. And so their outcome naturally is less good than the grade one or grade two that have a, a slower proliferation index called the KI-67. Now let's talk just a minute about the neuroendocrine cell itself. What are their special properties? These neuroendocrine cells, by the way, are our normal cells. We all make them. And embryologically, as we'll see in a moment, they come to distribute all the way down the midline of the body in various organs. So they can take up a precursor like tryptophan, which then can be made into serotonin. They can synthesize their own uh, hormone or another type of hormone. When I talk about hormones, you're talking about a substance that leaves one cell, goes to another cell, and exerts its action. And the word hormone means I arouse, I stimulate to, act, uh, to action. It comes from the Greek, it's a Greek military word that means I excite, I stimulate. And so when I use hormones, it's because these, these substances in the bloodstream travel as hormones when they're very high in the blood. Too much of a good thing is not good when you talk about normal uh, hormones in the body. And that's what we deal with many times with the neuroendocrine tumors. Too much of a good thing. Example, serotonin. Example, too much insulin in an insulinoma. Too much gastrin in a gastrinoma causes ulcer disease. So they express a specific receptor we now know as receptor subtype 2. We heard from Dr. Sachs this morning that there are five, nature gave us five receptors for one peptide hormone called somatostatin. That means if you're born without receptor 2, you've got 1, 3, 4, and 5 to do its action. That's how, that tells you in nature it's a very critically important regulating hormone. They can become tumorigenic. This is a slide that was given to me by the late Dr. Steve Qualman, a pathologist at the Ohio State University. I muted it a little bit by putting my SST2 receptors on it, but that's what your cells and my cells look like normally and in a tumor state. You can see the nucleus, you can see a clear area around it, and they all possess the receptors, thank goodness. Because if you have the receptors, you have enormous hope for, these, uh, for, for therapy of these uh, tumors. What else can they do? You can diagnose them by scanning. And there's a whole bunch of things on there, and as you can see, the top one is a, floor, is a dopamine. So a dopamine receptor is present on these cells, and you can use that for a, a PET scan. You can use octreotide, which is called octrea scan, and that binds to its specific receptor. You can also uh, use dopamine over on, the, on your left, and you can do, um, and oops, that's, sorry about that. And you can also do the one in the lower corner, which is, uh, which is um, uh, a deoxyglucose uh, PET scan. That scan tells you how fast the tumor is, is going. What's the metabolism of it? The other ones are identifying different functional receptors on the tumor, uh, on the cells. So here is the normal distribution in all of us. So as we become, as we become mature in, in utero, these cells come to reside in the thyroid, in the lung, in the pancreas, in the small bowel, even in the reproductive organs. Normal neuroendocrine cells. Are you surprised that these are the sites 
for the neuroendocrine tumors? And the answer is no. You're not surprised because those cells are there. Now, why they become a tumor, why they multiply, that we don't know. Sometimes it's a genetically inherited type of thing, multiple endocrine neoplasia one, multiple endocrine neoplasia two. The size of those circles aren't how big the tumors are because size does not matter for the small bowel, the most common. The size of the circle tells you what percent of the patients referred to our centers are. For the most part, 55% of the 1,700 people we follow actively have mid-gut tumors. That is, they began there. This is where the tumor is. The primary tumor began there. Second most common circle there is the lung, the bronchial carcinoids, and close behind it is the neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. So none of us are surprised be where, where these tumors can be, uh, grow because those cells are there. Why, though, they become a tumor is still a, a unknown. Genetics most probably contributes or predilections maybe, but we're learning, but we don't know. We'll hear from Dr. Warner in the genetics this afternoon. This is our schema. This is what I call a pathway of care, pathway of hope. And you see the patient up on the top. In the lower left corner, you see something very important where it says SST2 receptor stains. And we have come to a point now where we can take tissue from years ago of, from a patient and we can now semi-quantify the receptors on that tumor. And when a patient comes in to see me, I have that information from my pathologist and it opens up an avenue of care for these patients when they have receptors. So where I am, I go this way, straight down to PRRT. My medical oncology uh, colleagues go this way where they oversight hepatic arterial embolization therapy, where they oversight anti-angiogenic therapy, they can oversight the new novel low-dose captain capecitabine temozolomide therapy. Transplants are very hard to get, very difficult to get for a liver. And this is something that I've, you need to remember that's a good news, bad news. And that is your body recognizes these tumors when they go to different places as your own. So they don't react. It doesn't kill a liver, it doesn't kill bone, and it doesn't kill lymph nodes when they travel there. They live there. The fracture rate for a tumor in the bone of a neuroendocrine tumor is less than 1%. And that's a, that's a dramatic number because if they say, oh my God, it's in my bone, but it's there, it lives there kind of. It doesn't belong there, we gotta get rid of it, but it doesn't destroy. Your liver function test will stay normal. Patient two weeks ago came in, 90% of his liver was consumed by the neuroendocrine tumor. His liver tests were normal. No functional abnormalities whatsoever. Only when the tumor takes, and it should never happen, that they take over 100% of the liver, does the liver fail. So it's one of the most important organs you want to save all the time for a long, long time. But you can see that every box there has a time to progression. And it's on your slides, you have that. But I tried to put it in there uh, for, the, uh, for the benefit of you seeing time to progression. How long does it take this tumor to require another therapeutic change because of progression? We heard this morning, if you take the, if you take the primary out, even with metastasis, even if it's in your liver or in your lung, it's spread to your lung, you take the primary out and you've changed your survival, you bought another additional four to five years on average of life high quality life. That's a very important concept. Medical oncologists, normally when they see a tumor and it's in another part, it doesn't belong, it's metastasized, they don't go for the primary. And that's a whole different algorithm of care for these, for these tumors. Try to get rid of the primary when you can. Embolization has its own time to progression. We've had embolization. Dr. Warner is probably the pioneer of embolization to the liver 
In the 80s, he was doing this work where you choke off the, the bl blood vessels, the hepatic artery carries the blood to the tumors, you choke them off, and you can slow and kill some of those tumors in the liver. So that therapy's been around. Anti-angiogenic therapy, look at the time to progression. You have average years of three and four years of stability of your tumor with embolization. I love anti-angiogenics, but look at the average time before they progress, seven months. Are you going to jump in and with a medical oncologist say, and, and say, gosh, yes, this is the first thing I want to do when you still have tumor in your liver that can be embolized or you have your primary in? This is a holding kind of therapy. It doesn't kill the tumors, it stabilizes them. But they all carry an average time to progression. And if you add those years of time to progression for each modality, you can see and 10, 15 years, not only that, these arrows go back and forth. You're not losing an option, and that's my job and our job. You don't lose an option with an option. You work always to keep all options open all the time. And that's how we do, that's how you follow a, in a multidiscipline clinic your care. Now, this is the KI-67. We all know people come in and say, what's my KI-67? That's the first thing they ask. That is a proliferation. This is the original paper from 1993 on the KI-67. In a word, it represents a, a chromosome that, that is associated with tumor proliferation. All of our tumors have in them a clock a proliferation clock, it's there. And all you have to do is be able to semi-quantify it, and you can look at that natural course of that tumor by looking at the original or even the metastatic tumor. So this is a very specific substance that looks at a chromosome that represents proliferation, and they, they make an antibody to it. So here's the, here's the antigen on the chromosome in the nucleus, and they make an antibody that they can have attached and they can stain. And that's called a KI-67 stain. And I'll just move right on. And there is a stain of a tumor. And you count the dots on it and you divide by a thousand cells that are there. And that gives you a percent of your KI-67. You can see it's a nuclear staining. Nobody misses that. You can count the dots. Now, looking at all those dots, you'd say that's probably a high-grade, high-proliferation rate tumor, and indeed it is. It's a grade 3. Enrico Solci in 2000 took his pathology colleagues from around the world, nine of them, and they came up with the classification we all now recognize and accept, and it's called the World Health Organization Tumor Categories. And the first two, if you look up there, grade one or uh, grade one and grade two, they're both well differentiated. That means those cells look a lot like they're supposed to look normally. And that's very assuring. 95%, 92% of all the tumors we see are either grade one or grade two. That is to say they behave in a very predictable fashion for the most part. And those in their natural course, they have long lives associated with the proliferation rate. So grade one has a proliferation rate, a growth rate of less than 2%. You count the dots, divide by 1,000. Grade two has a 2 to 20%, and those are that many, those dots are counted, divided by 1,000 cells, and that gives you the percent. And the grade threes, in general, are accepted as the poorly differentiated, greater than greater than 20% proliferation. You can learn that information right with the tissue from the pathologist when they give it. Now, not only that, we can go even one step further and we can do the specific stain. Shown on your left is normal liver, shown on your right is tumor, and you see normal liver, and you see the receptor stain of the tumor, those, that brown, and in fact, you have a membrane, so the covering, the covering has the receptor on it. You're actually looking at the receptor on these cells with this stain, and there's the cytoplasm. This tumor has both the staining inside the cell 
and on the membrane. That's the somatostatin receptor subtype 2A. Okay, you can actually see it and you can semi-quantitate it. And that piece of information is enormously helpful because it gives a patient immediate hope when they come in. You've got receptors, we, you've got locks, We've got the keys, and that's what it's really all about with octreotide or lanreotide, really all about when you put a diagnostic on it to see it, and really what it's all about when you take that key and you put radioactive material on it, and now you have PRRNT, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. Now, this is, I, I, I put this special because uh, Dr. Warner has a, a knowledge and an interest in it. This is the newest uh, antibody that became available for pathologists worldwide for the staining of this subtype receptor. This is a when a when an antibody can be when a, a staining material can be perpetuated, and everybody can use it. You can commercialize it. Pathologists cannot commercialize anything that it's not available to all pathology labs. And Roybe, who is the father of receptor work in neuroendocrine tumors for the last 25 years, has made a monoclonal, a single antibody that can immediately identify those receptors, and, and it has predictive value. And that re reference you can see is on there if you want. It's in the American Journal of uh, Surgical Path in 2012. And I'll just go to the point, the bottom line and you must know this, so when you hear this information, you know if only 10% of your cells have the receptor on it. Let's say you have a slide with five or 600 cells. If only 10% have the receptor, it bodes positive for your, out, your ultimate therapy with Theranostics or with PRRNT. That's huge. 10% of a whole cell, of a whole slice of tumor, possessing those receptors bodes, predicts that you could do well with PRNT. That is huge information that we share with the patient when they walk in. They barely sit down, they fill out their form, and I said, got news, not milk, got news for you, good news. And that's exactly how we use this stain for every patient that comes to us. What is the problem with all of this business? Uh, pardon me. The problem when you talk about these tumors and making the clinical diagnosis is that most of the time these are symptoms. Symptoms come from the word symptoma. I feel, I fall actually. And it's a subjective evidence of disease or a physical disturbance observed not by us, but by the patient themselves. I have fatigue, I have diarrhea, I have, and that can be quantitated, yes, but when people say, I, my joints, I feel my joints are hurting, those are symptoms, and being able to use symptoms only with the, a diagnosis is very difficult, because these symptoms, as you know and, and may have experienced, can be episodic. They don't happen all, all the time and persistently. So that is the problem in the therapeutic interventions of these tumors. Our decisions are made on the gold standard. Everything is decided by a CT or an MR scan. If there's nothing there, the surgeons can't operate if they can't find it. But you're limited by the amount of in, the sensitivity of your instruments. So an MR and CT are the least sensitive, but they are the gold standard for doing changes in therapy with the patients. And again, symptomatic, asymptomatic, these are subjective criteria. Tumors that secrete these hormones that I tell you about don't secrete them all the time. They secrete them and they go down, they behave, they, they're non-autonomous. So an insulinoma may release insulin and cause low sugar and in the next instant be responsive to low sugar and turn off. So for a long time, these symptoms are episodic until the tumors become so spread that they sustain their abnormal level of hormone, and then nobody misses them. Uh, again, 
the basic principles of functioning neuroendocrine tumors, and I'm talking about the ones of the pancreas. I'm talking about the ones at the, in the midgut, the small intestine, sometimes the ones in the lung. Most of the ones in the lung are mechanical, cough, recurrent pneumonia come to detection. But for the most part, they don't really make an active hormone that we can, we can uh, uh, 3% three, uh, 3 of them will make serotonin, but those are, those are very unusual. But again, the symptoms and the syndromes are due to sudden elevations of these circulating uh, substances, be it serotonin or adrenaline or neuropeptides. And you should try to document wherever you can to support your, your, your theory, to, to support your diagnosis. Now, I'm going to move through these because these are the markers that we think are important for the, for the common tumors. Serotonin to us has become the single most important marker that we have for detection and for following the small bowel tumors, which are the most common, as I told you. Regarding carcinoid tumors, up until about eight years ago, you couldn't measure serotonin reliably. If you drew the blood and you put it on the table and you let it stay there not nice, in 30 seconds it's gone. So everybody was getting very low serotonin levels. Then a genius at a ARUP Labs thought about ascorbic acid, actually it came from Yale, the biochemist at Yale dropped ascorbic acid in it, vitamin C, and now you have serotonin preserved indefinitely in that patient. And so that's a very tricky collection, but in a place that knows how to collect them, you can get very reliable, very reproducible serotonin levels on a very regular basis. And the other point that was talked about in terms of 5-HIA, Serotonin breaks down into 5-hydroxyendolacetic acid. We all know that. And so a very good reflection of liver tumor burden could be had with a 24-hour collection of urine. But that's lugging a jug. And that's 24 hours, and it's very inconvenient. And now we have it so we can measure plasma 5-HIA. You can actually take a sample of blood and get the same average uh, breakdown of serotonin with just a blood sample. And that's been available now for at least in three labs for quite a period of time. But, but the 5-HIA is all we had because you couldn't measure serotonin directly. Now we can do that. So serotonin in the midgut is very rich. Those cells, where those cells come to live determines what hormone they're going to make. When your neuroendocrine cell settles in the pancreas, it can make insulin, glucagon, it can make several substances normally. When it settles and lives in the bowel, it makes serotonin predominantly, also makes another hormone, it's a neuro, not quite a hormone, it's called substance P, which man, means substance pain. That can be measured as well. We heard about bradykinin from Dr. Zacks this morning. That's another tachykinin that can be measured in the blood. But now in the United States, there's no commercial lab I'm aware of that measures it. But it's a very important biomarker. Foregut lung carcinoids don't make a lot of serotonin. Okay, they, And the stomach ones don't make a lot of serotonin. And the foregut includes the lung, stomach, and pancreas. The hindgut make almost no serotonin, so we don't have a good marker for picking those tumors up there. Now, we all know chromogranin A. Chromogranin A is the earth person substance that circulates in your blood that reflects how many neuroendocrine cells you have. We all make a chromogranin A. People with neuroendocrine tumors, by and large, make more chromogranin A but because there's more of those cells. And for a long time, including Europe, it became a gold standard biomarker. But it's, in, it's, it's a crude, it's crude. Some say the, that the chromogranin A is the sed rate of neuroendocrine tumors. If you know sed rate, anybody's got a little fever, anybody who doesn't feel good's got sniffles, the sed rate goes up. So it's kind of nonspecific. But the breakdown product of chromogranin A is very important, pancreastatin. 
and that's a hormone you can measure. It's a it is a hormone actually. It travels and exerts an action when it becomes that smaller substance. But it's very sensitive for predicting tumor activity. Just a point about chromogranin A, we probably get five consultations a month of people who have been on PPIs, proton pump inhibitors for a period of time, some longer, some shorter. And their chromogranin A comes back elevated in, in many people. And that's due to the fact that when you shut acid down by that much, and Dr. Warner can speak to it better than I, when you shut acid down beyond 70%, you rise a hormone from your stomach called gastrin. Gastrin then causes a problem with the chromogranin A production in the stomach. It's all coming from the stomach. It's not coming from a tumor. So when you have a high chromogranin A, you have to measure gastrin. And the other thing you measure is pancreastatin because when it's not a neuroendocrine tumor, chromogranin may be high, gastrin will be high, but pancreastatin will be normal. If you have a neuroendocrine tumor, pancreastatin will be elevated in that setting. So you have to be very careful. Um, so we developed the assay a, a little bit ago. I did one at Ohio State, and then we developed this assay uh, for commercial use. Uh, Inner Science Institute, um, uh, uh, we helped characterize it for them. And Inner Science Institute and Cambridge both have pancreastatin assays. I would say in general, I would say in general that you have uh, that you both both pancreastatin assays are helpful. I think you have more consistent results from the from the Inner Science Institute lab uh, in California. But Cambridge will also uh, give you a, a level, and if it, if it's suspected, sometimes you can you may have to have it repeated. But pancreastatin is a very, very important substance that you can measure in these tumors. And here's an example of a patient. And on that jagged arrow going up, that's pancreastatin every time the tumor showed activity. And on the bottom is what happens to their chromogranin A and their 5-HIA. These were all mid-gut tumors. And as you can see, they, were staying, they stayed negative, And the pancreastatin was picking up the action the activity of the tumor every time. CT scan would show progression, pancreastatin would predict it. So it's a very, very sensitive uh, assay. This one is the one that's still enigmatic to me. It's called neurokinin A. I'm talking about mid-gut tumor markers in the blood. And the neurokinin A is a tachykinin. And Dr. Wolderine just recently published a, a lovely paper looking at his patients with neurokinin A and their values. And it matched perfectly the Northern Ireland neurokinin A. We did split samples. We gave, the, we gave Ireland our split samples of patients. They gave us their split samples of patients. We measured them on two different test methods. And what happened, 180 patients, what happened was this. When the neurokinin A went, stayed below 50, you could see the survival probability going very long. If the neurokinin A jumped above an absolute value of 50, it changed the probability of survival. The good news is you can bring that 50 down below 50, and they then become the same probability of survival why that has happened, why it's an absolute value, I can't say. For 25 years, I did assays. And usually with a radioimmunoassay, the way we test these substances, there's about a 20% flexibility. There is no flexibility in this particular test. It's absolute, 50 or less, 50 or more. But it's a very good marker to follow for midgut because it tells you if it's changing its nature. Now, this is, um, this is a paper that Dr. Howe just published in terms of pancreastatin. It's been confirmed by Dr. Waldering, who did the same thing with a different population of intestinal tumors, the duodenal tumors. And you, it says just what it says. Pancreastatin predicts survival in neuroendocrine tumors. So that blood marker itself can help with predicting survival, 
can help you change, can help you manage uh, these tumors. And in our case, we had 78 pancreatic and 98 small bowel. And we looked at Kaplan-Meier, which are the progressive curves for probability of survival. We looked at be, uh, baseline pancreastatin and after uh, perturbation. I won't go into all of that. It's there if you want it. The paper's there. And it showed that elevated pa uh, preoperative pancreastatin was associated with a, me a shorter progression-free survival and overall survival was changed when the pancreastatin was high at the very beginning. But you can change it. If you can lower that in their course, they take on a normal survival uh, predi predictability. But one of the things I was most uh, excited about was to show you, um, I thought I had the serotonin. You can use serotonin uh, th uh, if you check serotonin for the small bowel tumors, you can collect serotonins. I have 12 and 13 serotonins over many years on a single patient. But if that serotonin bumps by doubling, it, it absolutely tells you that the, uh, that the tumor is now taking on a more aggressive form. It's, a, it's an excellent biomarker for predicting uh, activity of the tumor. But you have to do them serially. But the pancreastatin looks like it's a very important prognostic tool. And it can, uh, it can identify patients at high risk for survival who could uh, benefit from novel therapies. So what I'm saying uh, is the serotonin can be obtained very widely commercially. These are all CLIA approved uh, uh, centers. And I'll have a list of them at the end. But the early data with the, uh, with the blood levels of serotonin show a predictive value of almost 90% and a negative predictive value of 93% in mid-gut carcinoids, and that's the reference. Serotonin is elevated in 96% of mid-gut tumors, okay? No doubt about it. And that's, that's why it's so important to go straight to the source of what causes these tumors what's associated with the biomarker for these tumors. So the three biomarkers that we talk about all the time that should be done on a regular basis for you, especially for mid-gut, probably for pancreas, and probably for lung, is the chromogranin A and pancreastatin. Neurokinin A seems to be reserved for a uh, mid-gut tumor only. So those three markers are pretty important to keep in mind when you're, when you're being evaluated by your docs. Here is a native somatostatin the way God gave it to us. Here is octreotide on the left. Here is lanreotide on the right. If you look at these two lookalikes of the native, you can see pretty quickly that they came close to mimicking what nature made. But they made, these companies made longer acting forms of this substance so it lasts in your blood, uh, it lasts up to a, a two hours in the blood before half of it's gone versus native somatostatin which lasts in your blood only one minute and a half at the most. So these are both synthetic uh, lookalikes of native uh, somatostatin. The genius is in how they were able to do it with just eight proteins versus nature's, which is 14 proteins. But if you look very carefully, those shaded areas are identical to the native. And lysine is the docking area. So, that, so if lanreotide is the arrow, then it sticks to this membrane using the one protein called lysine. And that's how it binds. So you have a peptide binding to its membrane in a very kinetic way. Now, just a word on the two studies recently, one older, one newer, that says one thing, and I'm just going to tell you what it says. We knew for a long time that octreotide is used for symptom control, diarrhea, mostly. But it was expanded and used for all neuroendocrine tumors over the years, since 1989. They, they, they did a paper where they gave nothing to the patient, 
or octreotide to the patient and they followed them for six years in five centers in Germany. That's called the ProMid study. What they ended up saying is that octreotide has a mild anti-proliferative effect. We've known for a long time that that action isn't just to cover symptoms that we heard about this morning, but it also had an anti-proliferative. It kept the, c the cells from growing. The definitive same result came from the Lanreotide paper in the New England Journal. You can see the date on it. It was 19, it was just 2014. And what they showed was the very same thing, that if you give Lanreotide versus nothing to a patient with a, with with uh, a stable midgut intest small intestinal tumors, and you followed them forward, that you had an anti-proliferative effect on, uh, on the tumors, kept them from growing. That means it went from symptom control to therapeutic agent. And that's what's so wonderful about these two analogs. They are therapy. Just using them alone is therapy. And you saw on that schema that I showed you, the time to progression can be as far out on average of two years. That is to say, it'll hold the tumors at using different adjustments of the, of the levels of it, different doses, you can, you can keep the tumor at bay. Doesn't kill it, the tumor, but it stops it. And this is the theranostic application. There, in this case, is octreotide, again. But now there's a cage over there called DOTA. And in, inside the cage, if you put gallium, you have a scan. If you take gallium out and you put yttrium in, you have a therapy. If you take yttrium out and you put lutetium in, you have a therapy. And the combination of this very same substance using either a diagnostic or a therapeutic is called theranostics. Okay, is it clear? Right now we didn't have it. The study that came out, the Ludothera study, the AAA study, the Netter study, all the same. They used Octreoscan for the Gnostic and they used Lutetium modified Octreotide for the therapy. So that's not theranostics. Using the identical arrow makes it theranostics. I'll show you just one thing uh, after this. Here's the same concept. Here's the tumor, and on the tumor are the receptors. Here's the arrow. In this case, it's the octreotide I just showed you. And there's the cage. And that piece sticks onto the target. And when it goes, it, when it sticks onto the target of the tumor, it's taken inside the cell or it stays on the membrane itself. So you have two sources of energy coming from this cell. So the cell that takes the energy, the radioactive material, doesn't get killed by that arrow. It, the, that arrow hurts something somewhere else and another arrow from another cell hurts the cell. So it's crossfire. And uh, this is the paper that I just want to share with you. We had uh, 150 tumors. Uh, we've sent over 500 patients to Basel, Switzerland for the PRRT before we had it at the university. And this was uh, beginning 13 years ago. The patients were treated and came back, or we treated some ourselves uh, because we actually had the Theranost, we actually had the Y90 PRRT in, in 2001, Novartis actually had the drug and they allowed that study to be done. And we did that study in 2001 and we followed our patients forward for 13 years. These are patients that had PRRT. And the only thing we did different was we gave them all octreotide or lanreotide forward. So all the patients after PRRT got uh, octreotide in between. Whereas Europe, when they first started with PRRT, they used to tell the patients, don't go back on octreotide, you don't need it. But we kept them on octreotide. And what we found is something very important. If you look at how long does it take to progress, a patient to progress their tumor after PRRNT, 
The average time for small bowel is five years. The average time for PNETs after PRNT on octreotide is five years. If you look at all the literature in Europe on PRNT, the average time to progression, average, that means 50% of the time, is about 3.4, 3.5 years. And so ours came out to be five years just doing that, just giving them octreotide. So now we feel very comfortable that that combination for patients that have PRRT and then get, should get octreotide in between, that you can extend the quality of life and the time to progression now five years. And now we've started, we have one protocol with the Theranostics, we've treated 10 patients. And I just can't tell you how powerful uh, PRRNT is um, the very first patient actually had a grade three, a high grade three, and you say, how would that be? They don't have much receptors, but we measured the receptors with the antibody, and he had, he had SST2 receptors on his more aggressive grade three tumor. So we offered him the gallium 68, and every bone in his back had tumor in it, every vertebra. He couldn't get out of a chair easily. I'm not trying to dramatize this in any way. He couldn't get out of the chair. We gave him one treatment of PRRT using yttrium 90. This was now two months ago. We waited a week to call him at home to see how he was doing. He wasn't at home. He went to Colorado to hike. Okay. Trust me, you know, trust me, I'm Italian, but this is actually the truth. I'm telling you the truth. And it's in his second treatment the same way. He's had no bone pain, no, clinically no pain since he's had the radioactive therapy. And the gallium 68 said those, those lesions, those tumors in the bone, he's never broken a bone by the back, never broken one, but he had tumors up and down his vertebra. So it goes to make a couple of points. It lives in the bone, it lives in the liver, it doesn't destroy the liver. Steve Jobs, that was written up, his liver was destroyed because of a surgical misadventure because then when he was putting his liver back in, the, the bile duct that carries bile to the intestine got closed off and that regurgitated and hurt his first liver. The second liver was more of an aggressive behavior of the pancreatic tumor in him, but the first liver uh, wasn't because of the tumor. Uh, but I think we say that PRNT, and this is what I was talking about, the paradigm. We believe, and uh, Dr. Warner told me last night, there's, there's one group now that are moving PRRNT way up after surgery, and if you go back and look at my schema, you'll see that I have surgery and the line goes straight down to PRRNT if you go back and look. All of this time, because it's not approved, you had to wait until there was progressive disease and at least one modality of therapy was tried before you could consider PRRNT. If all goes well, the Lutathera trial will be approved maybe in 2016 or at the end of 2016, it'll be FDA approved in the United States. That means it's a standard level of care. That means insurances will be obliged and Medicare will be obliged to pay for it. In which case then people will be able to use PRNT immediately after surgery. In other words, that's how, that's how valuable it is, not as a, a last resort therapy, which everybody seems to mentally have, but as a very first, first line therapy right after surgery. So I think we're going to see some really very important studies coming out over the next five years doing that, uh, looking at the benefit of surgery followed by the PRRNT. These are the reference labs. I just, I'm not making a pitch for any of them, but just to tell you that they're commercially available. You can, uh, the reference labs for serotonin include ARUP and Quest and Mayo and LabCorp and Viracore and InterScience Institute. Cambridge Labs and OSU, they're all there. Uh, they're all approved. They're all certified. So for serotonin, you can go ARUP, Quest, or LabCorp. For CGA, chromogranin A, you see the list underneath that. For pancreastatin, 
ISI has the published one. Cambridge isn't published theirs. University Reference Labs at Ohio State published theirs. So there's three sources for pancreastatin testing. And for the neurokinin A, uh, Cambridge I don't think has it. The only one I'm aware of that has it is Inner Science Institute. And they have a pretty good turnaround. It's about two weeks. But I think if you have a midgut, I would suggest those three tests as I told you. Pro, uh, pancreastatin, chromogranin A, and neurokinin A. That's a tachykinin. And this is our group at, uh, at the university. This is the cast of thousands. We heavily, uh, we work heavily with nuclear medicine who have helped us advance uh, the, the gallium 68 scan, PET scan. NIH has a protocol for uh, the gallium 68 uh, PET scan for diagnostic. Uh, UCLA, I believe, has, has theirs up. Stanford has a limited use of the gallium. Uh, we've had the gallium now for three years. Uh, Dr. Sue and our group own the IND as it was brought up by Ipsen today and what they call an investigator's new drug because these will probably, gallium will never be a standard level of care. It's going to be a cost recovery kind of scan. Uh, Octrea scan is a, covered, uh, is a covered scan as you all know but the gallium will, will, will be a cost recovery by request. And we've been very successful. We have about 95% insurer coverage for the gallium. And, um, the, uh, and the, the theranostic part of it, you know, I'm not, uh, Excel Diagnostics, Abe Delpassant has a, a, a business where he does, he treats, the, uh, he treats with lutetium, uh, PRRT that came from Rotterdam that's the same as the uh, Lutathera trial. So he's, I think he's actively doing that. And we have the uh, Y90, thera, uh, thera, we have Theranostics, the Y90, Dodatoc at the university. And we have only one protocol right now and we're going to develop two more. Hopefully that we'll be able to expand the uh, ability to treat more patients with it. And uh, I appreciate very much your time, and I'm most happy to answer any questions. I wish you peace. Thank you very much.